All right, we continue with our special series, Centenary and Beyond, to mark 100 years since the founding of the Communist Party of China. Today, we look back at how the party maintained its pioneering role and improved itself, with our reporters bringing you stories from the past and present. And we get more insights from special guests as well uh, on what drives the party in fulfilling its present mission. We focus on how the party led the Chinese people in winning wars before the foundings, uh, the founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949, and how today it continuously improves itself with the yen and spirit of determination, optimism, and commitment by seeking truth from facts. And we'll talk to Dong Xue in Yan'an in northwestern China's Shanxi province and Cui Huiao in Beijing. Uh, Dong Xue is at the site where Chairman Mao Zedong used to live and work. And uh, Cui Huiao is at the party school of the CPC Central Committee, the top venue for training senior party members. Uh, well, before we go to our reporters, we learn more about the role the Shanxi province played in the party's history. Yesterday, we focused on how the party continues to advance despite danger and difficulty in the spirit of the Red Army's long march of 12,500 kilometers over eight decades ago, uh, 80 decades ago. And after the long march, the eight decades, uh, correction here, and after the long march, the Red Army settled in northwest China's Shanxi province. Today, uh, we find out why they chose that location for their headquarters. When the Chinese Central Red Army was forced onto the long march, they had only a rough direction in mind. Nobody knew where they'd end up settling down until September 1935. Mao Zedong and other leaders learned from local news outlets that several other Red Army forces were based in Shanxi province, where nationalist governance was weak. So the leaders decided to march towards the region and try to link up with their comrades. After surviving 11 provinces and countless battles, the weary Red Army soldiers, dressed in ragged summer clothes with mud on their feet, finally ended their exodus. In October, when they arrived in Wuchi County, about 100 kilometers from Yan'an, the once 86,000 strong force had been reduced to just 6,000. A new beginning awaited the Red Army in the chilly winds of the Great Northwest. But before that, something had to be settled. Three nationalist cavalry regiments stalking the Red Army approached, and Mao ordered an ambush beset on the ridges and trenches of the Soviet district, leaving local residents out of the fight. The revolutionary leader was highly confident in his comrades' abilities, despite how exhausted they were. In the final showdown of the Long March, later known as the tail-cutting battle, the Red Army eliminated the last of the nationalists who'd been tailing them once and for all. It marked the end of a 12,500-kilometer journey and a new chapter in the arduous yet legendary Yan'an. All right, now let's go to Yan'an, where Dong Xue is standing up for Thank us. Uh, Dong Xue, hello there. Uh, so how special is uh, that particular location you are in? Uh, why you are talking to us uh, at this particular point in Yan'an? Well, well, Donny, welcome to Yan'an, a city known as the Red Cradle of Chinese Revolution. Where, where I am standing right now is a place called the Yang Jiali. It's now turning into a popular tourist site. Well, because it's one of the scene of the most defining moments in China's modern history. Well, uh, more specifically from 90. 38 to 1947, it served as the wartime stronghold of the Communist Party of China. Many important decisions were finalized here and, and excuse me, and enabled the victory to the subsequent communist revolution and eventually brought out the founding of a new China. And speaking of revolutionary, we have to mention uh, Mao Zedong, one of the party's early leaders. And behind me is exactly where he stayed during the period in 
Yan'an, and this specific type of building is called the Yao Dong in China, which means artificial caves. It usually has a long vaulted room dug into on the side of a mountain with a semicircular entrance and covered with rice papers or colorful quilts. And before, uh, uh, it not only uh, housed uh, Chairman Mao, but also Premier Zhou Enlai and other party leaders. And one of the special features it offered is, is that it was cool in the summer and warm in winter. And before we get inside and take a close closer look. I'm happy to be joined by my guest, Professor Fred Engst from the University of International Business and Economics. Great to have you here. Thank you for inviting so me. So you mentioned that your parents come to China during the 1940s all the way from the United States and were joined to the Communist Revolution. They got married in Yan'an and you've been constantly visiting this place ever since. So how do you feel revisit this place this time? Well, this place has changed uh, tremendously. Uh, when I first came here in 1962, I was only 10 years old, and my parents uh, uh, were eager to show my grandmother about this place, for this is the place where they uh, first uh, came to China in early years. Yeah, so this was a very primitive place, and was, but, but also the place they were able to lead the Chinese Revolution and the mobilize people in their billions, millions. And um, it shows that if you have a, um, if you are on the side of the majority of the people, you are eventually gain the support of the, the majority of the people. And then eventually you can win the state. It's and an incredible experience. Yes, and, and I suppose that's the reason why the CPC remain popular right now. Okay, now let's take inside of the bedroom where Chairman Mao used to live. And now let's get inside of the room. As you can see, is the living arrangements are quite spartan, I would say, you know, with only a bed, a wardrobe, and two chairs. And for this bed, it looks like a regular bed. But as, but as you probably know, you know, people living in the north, they usually sleep on the Kang. Well, we, we call it a Kang in China, which is a heat ball brick bed. But, you know, since Mao, is, he came from the central south of China, so he was not used to the heated bed. So that's why this is one of the few privileges he enjoyed uh, as the party leader to have a normal bed. I'm not sure it is a privilege because the winter time is cold. The, the con is really warm in the winter well, time. That makes sense. Well, yeah. now let's move into the office. Well, these two rooms are actually connected together. Mm -hmm. Well, so if we t take a look at the picture hanging on the wall, you know, Chairman Mao was writing in Chinese. It reads, using our own hands to create ample food and clothing. Well, this slogan were, was raised up in 1939 when you know, both the people and the army were facing tremendous hardships in face of both the Japanese aggressions and the natural disaster. Also the encirclements. I mean, just that they, they don't want people with things that can't come in here. Yeah, so my, my parents uh, came to China in the late uh, 40s and they experienced the same thing. You have to, they have to make their own thread using cotton wool and then make their own sweaters, make their own, everything had made by hand. So what they were able to do is um, to overcome the difficulties and mobilize all the people, the army soldiers who are not engaged in battle into a production process. And self-reliance is the, the, the spirit that left the Chinese Communist Party, led them to the victory. They're basically doing everything on their own. Yes. And, and at this specific desk, I want to share another story is where this is Chairman Ma who came up with the theory on New Democracy, which was later printed in the book of um, selected works by Mao Zedong, right? Well, I think the idea of new democracy is, you know, a very important step forward as, you know, Chairman Mao has his goals and visions for a new China under the party guidance. Yeah, very important. Well, that was a quick tour <laughs> inside where Chairman Mao used to work and live. Uh -huh. And as I mentioned earlier, Yang Jiali is a, has also witnessed many important occasions in the history of Communist Party of China, and one of which is the CPC's 7th National Congress, which was held in 1945 in the Great Auditorium. Oh, now, yeah, yeah. let's take a look. 
The break meeting hall was originally built in 1942 by party officials three years before the convening of the Seventh National Congress of the Communist Party of China. The meeting lasted 50 days, had over 750 participating representatives, and elected Mao Zedong as chairman of the Central Committee. And Mao Zedong thought was affirmed to be the guideline and framework of the CPC. Inside the meeting hall, you can see the picture of Mao Zedong and Zhu De, the founder of the Chinese Army, as well as 24 red flags symbolizing the CPC's 24 years of struggle. What's more, two quotes can be found on both sides of the wall, namely "preserve the truth" and "correct mistakes." At the time, many within the CPC had differing opinions as how to carry out the revolution. Chairman Mao was against studying Marxism in isolation from the realities of Chinese society. He opposed blind worship, saying one has no right to speak without investigation. So, speaking of correcting mistakes, what do you think the party can learn from the history? Well, I, I'm not sure、um, about how to correct the mistakes、uh, because I'm not in party.、Um, but one thing I learned from this、uh, history is that、um, if you side on with a majority, overwhelming people, you will gain the support of overwhelming majority people.、Uh, so the mass line cannot be a, just a simple slogan; it has to be in practice, be with the people, and so that's the most important thing. Yes, because the people matters, right? right? So here we are at this specific stone table, where you know one of the American journalists who, who was talking to Chairman Mao during the 1940s. Shall we just take a seat? Okay. Okay, so the story was, you know, Anna Louis Strong. She was visiting here in Yan'an and talked to、uh, Chairman Mao. It was he, it was her fifth visit, and she asked a strong question like, "Suppose the United States threw an atomic bomb, how do you feel?" So, and Chairman Mao responded this、uh, very famous quote, which has been quoted a lot. But back then, so he said, "All re- reactionary is paper tiger." So it, it actually is a new word coming coming out from Chairman Mao. So the paper, paper tiger, what he was referring to, is they all look strong in appearance, but they're not powerful at all. It's only the people who are powerful, right? right? Being so being interrupted by the history. Yeah, that was the、uh, conversation、uh, Chairman Mao had with a journalist coming from the United States. And you said earlier when you visited back. Your early experience in the U.S. made you、uh, believe why made you believe and understand why your parents are believed so firmly in communism. So, can you elaborate on that? Well, I mean, av- after living in both in the U.S. and China for over 30 years, and this contrast made me able to understand the choice they made by their life. Well,、uh, they are the product of World War II. They witness how imperialism. Can threaten the, the humanity and their very existence, especially during the nuclear age. So basically,、uh, come to China and participate in the Chinese Revolution.、Uh, they were able to help a backward country to develop, and so they were able to、uh, both doing the work that they enjoy and love to do, and also be part of the international effort to fight against imperialism. So that combination was the best thing, and most happiest in their life. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you, Professor Ins, for、uh, these interesting stories and your thoughts on the Communist Party of China. Well,、uh, back in that time, there was another American journalist called Helen Foster Snow. She、uh, cemented her position in a his- in a history by risking her life traveling all the way to Yan'an and talk to party mem- party leaders, including Mao Zedong, Zhu De, and others. And our and and my colleague Sean Callops earlier paid a visit to her home. Back in the United States, and filed this report. Cedar City, Utah, bills itself as an historic town, surrounded by breathtaking canyons. Early pioneers worked this red soil to mine iron. Here, at the entrance to the city park, stands a bronze statue, another important nod to history. One of the most important journalists of the 20th century, that most Americans have simply never heard of. Helen Foster Snow, a fact her family readily admits. I would say Helen is the best kept secret between U.S.-China relations.、Um, she really showed the example of what it means to be a bridge between our two countries. 
Helen arrived in Shanghai in 1931 to work at the U.S. consulate as a secretary. It was a time Westerners were pampered and lived a high life while in China. As she started seeing the suffering and noticed uh, the political upheaval that was going on, she realized that she had a much bigger part to play and she wanted to tell that story to the world. And that's when she met Edgar Snow. A hardened, experienced international journalist, Edgar Snow wrote one of the definitive books chronicling the start and growth of China's communist movement, called Red Star Over China. It was a time of great upheaval as factions wrestled for control of China. Japanese invaders, the Kuomintang Nationalist Party, and the fledgling Communist Party under Mao Zedong. She stopped thinking about herself and she really found her voice in telling the stories of other people. And that's what her life was dedicated to for the next 80 years. By now, Helen and Edgar were married and lived in Beijing. And in 1937, Helen cemented her place in history when she risked her life to travel from Beijing to Yan'an in Shaanxi province to meet and interview Chinese Communist Party leaders such as Mao Zedong and Zhu Da. Helen Snow was one of the few eyewitnesses to the early period of the communist movement, uh, one of the early Western observers, and had been in Yan'an. Her stories were published in newspapers throughout the world under the pen name of Nim Wales. By now, the Fosters say the Japanese wanted both Edgar and Helen assassinated, so they returned to the United States, Helen bringing a treasure trove of manuscripts, items, and nearly 11,000 photographs she took while in China. This is just a very small sampling of those uh, 10,000 or 11,000 images. In terms of history, just priceless. A young Mao next to Judah. And this rich collection was donated to Brigham Young University and is just now being preserved and chronicled. After returning home, Ellen and Hedger drifted apart, eventually divorcing. Living quietly in a small Connecticut town in the northeastern part of the U.S. until she died, at the age of 89 in 1997. But ask the Fosters, who have grown to embrace and love China, considering the sour relations between Beijing and Washington, they believe the world needs another Helen Foster Snow. That's my favorite question. <laughs> um, I, I think I get emotional about this. Everything I thought I knew about China was false. Um, and then when I went to China and met the people and their hospitality and their personality and just who they are, you know, I realized uh, they're just like me. Adam Foster created a foundation to keep Helen's work and memory alive and to help develop better people-to-people -people ties between China and the U.S. He hopes when one day people ask, have you ever heard of Helen Foster Snow? The answer will be, of course. What an amazing woman and an amazing story. Sean Caleb, CGTN, Salt Lake City, Utah. Well, that was a quiet memorial visit both to Yan and, and to the hometown of Edgar Snow, reflecting on the difficult times of war in China when the Young Communist Party struggled to build a new China. In the age of peace, and the party today carries with it Yan's spirit of determination, optimism, and commitment as the country rises to prosperity. So now we go live to Tsui Huiyao, who is uh, standing by at the party school of the CPC Central Committee in Beijing. And that school was established in Yan'an and then later moved into Beijing. So Huiyao, what do you have for us? Hello, Dongning. Where I'm standing right now is China's top party school. And behind me is the sculpture of Chairman Mao Zedong. He was the principal of this school back in the 1940s. Now many, this is a place where the party elites are trained and many of the graduates taking off from here become high level government cadres. Now this place offers just more than training. It also acts as a think tank that generates important policy initiatives. Currently, there are over thousands of party schools across the country forming an extensive network that plays a central role in the building of the CPC. Now take a look at this stone tablet next to me. It says 实事求是, 
in English it means seeking truth from facts. Now this has long been a guiding principle of the CPC and it was written by Chairman Mao Zedong in 1943. Back then the Central Party School had just been established in Yan, where my colleague Dong Xue was and some of the words were needed for the front of the building and Chairman Mao was the principal. He wrote the words which later became the school's model. And in 1947, Kuomintang bombed Yan'an, forcing the party school to relocate, but the stone tablet was somehow preserved by local villagers, and since then has become a historic relic, which now sits in a museum in Yan'an, and what you're seeing right here is a replica. Of course, the model Shi Shi Qiu Shi continues to impact party members across the country today, especially those studying right here in the party school. So for more, I'm now joined by a school teacher of the party school, her name is Liu Ping. Now, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we have two questions for you. Uh, we have two questions. The first one is, why did the CPC chose seeking truth from facts as the basic ideological line? It's truly important. It's the basic ideological line. By rely on seeking truth from facts, the CPC grew bigger and stronger. And as you said, this is also the model for the party school since the onset of the CPC, the Maoism has become the scientific guidance. But even with that, can we have the available pathway for our revolution? No. And revolution must start from any central metropolis and then spread to cover the whole nation, including the rural areas, in order to seize the power. But according to CPC, we mainly focus on the necessity of putting our priorities in the rural areas instead of the KMT's pathway of uh, centralizing on the cities. So we hope to mobilize the majority of the rural people and that's why we followed the revolutionary pathway of uh, seizing the power with the great majority in the rural areas. And that is because of the guiding principle of seeking truth from facts and because of our position in the basic Chinese conditions. And the rural people voluntarily reacted. For example, we also have some other household contracting system in place, and we also have the autonomy system for the villagers. All of the two principles actually were initiated by the farmers in China, and as the ruling party, the CPC must discover such good principles and then transmit it for our revolution. Thank you. My second question to Professor is, as we know, Yan An used to attract a lot of youngsters to it because of its progressiveness. But after so many years of ruling, how can CPC maintain its progressiveness? Speaking of progressiveness, the CPC must represent the fundamental interest of the masses. It must walk in the leading way of the whole era in order to benefit the mankind. Now, progressiveness is also referring to representing representing the fundamental interest of the Chinese people and the Chinese nation. For example, in the modern era, we must realize the aspiration of our people for a better life. As you know, now we have basically stabilized the um, poverty reduction outcomes. Our lives have been improved. So all our focuses are about improving our livelihood, not just the material interest, but also to political, economic, cultural, and even ecological civilization development. So for very a long time. Locals in Beijing, once waking up, pay their first attention to the air quality. Is there any smog today? So we are starting to put our sight on the environmental issues. And accordingly, there are many national policies. For example, the uh, disposal of the tail gas. For example, for the second-hand vehicles, there will be some replacement policies and the promotion of NEVs. With those policies, now we are able to enjoy such beautiful weather all year round, just like today. I think it accounts for 70% of all the days to enjoy such a clear weather. So with the support of our economic strengths, CPC must also strictly govern the party itself. Since the 18th National Congress, we start to pay attention to the hazards brought by the corruption. So is CPC daring enough to count 
against corruption, it takes gut. So the CPC Central Committee with Comrade Xi Jinping as the core gave the answer. That is, we are not going to fail our 1.3 billion population. So we gave a correct answer to that question. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was our uh, Professor Liu Ping from China's top party school. Thank you. Now, speaking of the pioneering role of the CPC, well, one example she just gave us is this anti-corruption campaign that was launched since the 18th National Congress of the CPC. Now, back in 2012, a sweeping campaign quickly swept across the country, zero tolerance policy on corruption of any type. And now it's been well over nine years since the policy was initially carried out. How has it impacted the country's public service system? What measures have been proven to be effective? Earlier, I spoke to a professor from Tsinghua University to hear his take on this campaign. Following the 18th National Congress of the Communist Party of China, Beijing launched a massive anti-corruption campaign. One famous concept is striking tigers and swatting flies, meaning the crackdown targets not only corrupt high-ranking officials, but low-ranking ones as well. But according to Professor Alessandro Texera, who teaches public policy at Tsinghua University, the key to the campaign's success has been a willingness to tackle the problem head on. One of the most critical elements is to make the society to have conscious, to make this a public subject to address that is very important because the CPC members are members of the society. They need to be the role model of the Chinese society. So how exactly has the CPC done it? Punishment has been an important tool. In 2020 alone, disciplinary inspection and supervisory organs across the country investigated about 618,000 corruption cases, leading to the punishment of over 600,000 people. Make them accountable in different measures. Can be punitive, can be uh, improving behavior, Okay, there is a lot of different tones in terms of how you, 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 you apply this punitive measure. But Professor Tex Zero says punishment and building a good system alone are not enough to prevent corruption. Back in 2016, President Xi Jinping said, quote, we need to guide people to do better and give full play to the guiding role of ideals, beliefs, and morality. In other words, moral education is key. Corruption doesn't happen just only in the government. They happen in the society, they happen in a company. So educating them, okay, and show what is right, what is the virtues, what is the values, that's very important. From party schools to local communities, teaching people about corruption has become a central feature of recent years. As an old saying goes, it takes a good blacksmith to make good steel. And the CPC also continues to urge officials to stay true to the party's original aspiration. That is, seeking happiness for the Chinese people and the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. To Huel, CGTM, Beijing. All right, now for some insights into this topic, joining us in the studio is Professor uh, Wang Xinzu from the School of Social Development and Public Policy at Beijing Normal University. Thank you very much for joining us, Professor. Well, first of all, over uh, the past 100 years, critical has it been? Uh, CPC still maintains its, uh, uh, its pioneering role? Uh, well, the Communist Party of China is supposed to be a pioneer party, which means that it is meant to lead the rest of the society toward independence and uh, prosperity. So keeping on top of the national conditions, the mainstream ideology, and the changing society is very essential for being an advanced party. Mm. Um, however, uh, depending on the historical context, the being advanced means different things. For example, mm -hmm. during the revolutionary era, mm -hmm. the Communist Party had developed a, a strong ideology based mm -hmm. on Marxism-Leninism, uh, adapted, however, to the Chinese conditions. Uh, the Communist Party of China also honed its revolutionary skills and strategies so that it was able to eventually win over the majority of the peasantry mm -hmm. and other social classes and mm -hmm. win over the wars. Mm -hmm. Now, in the reform era, the party then readapted its ideology to the changing societies where uh, the economy has, be, has become more uh, mm. diversified. Mm. At the same time, it has cultivated a new generation of uh, 
party officials and bureaucrats who are younger and better educated. Mm. So all in all, I think the party has, uh, on, on the one hand, upheld the mainstream ideology, but on the other hand, it has, it has always adapted it's always been pragmatism. Mm -hmm. Well, in modern time, especially, um, you mentioned reform. Mm -hmm. We made some achievements, a lot of great achievements, actually, in terms of reforms and anti-corruption, uh, etc. But it doesn't mean mission accomplished, right? Yeah. So, uh, how do you think CBC can maintain its a pioneering role with the development of time? Right, keeping adaptive to the changing society is really a difficult job. And plus, the party is facing a number of uh, 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 obstacles. For example, number one, uh, the party membership has grown to 92 million, you know, which is a small percentage, 6.6% to the Chinese overall population. But the absolute number is quite large, which means the members are ever more diverse. At the same time, it's getting ever more difficult to keep the members being cohesive to a centralized ideology. So for that matter, the party needs to rely on its party school system, as mm. we just saw in the program, uh, to train the, uh, the party members with the centralized ideology. Uh, number two, you know, as the party is taking an ever more increasing leadership role in governance, in, including on, govern on economic governance issues, which means uh, clean practice is hard to keep. So anti-corruption is very important because corruption also corrupts the spirit of the party and also the trust of the general public. So the anti-corruption campaign has to go on. But more importantly, I think the party also needs to institutionalize its anti-corruption efforts. And lastly, I think keeping adaptive to the changing society is not a unique problem for the Communist Party of China, but also for all political entities across the world. Mm. So for that matter, I think the party also needs to look outward for better practices and experience. In fact, the party has learned a great deal in the past from outside experiences, mm. and that you know, the experience can continue for the mm. party. Right, and the pioneering role and also the advantage of the party's mm. leadership is, has has been quite obvious, especially this time in yeah. terms of controlling the pandemic. All right, thank you very much, Professor Wang Xinzong from uh, Beijing you. Normal University. Well, in China, there are over 91 million CPC members and they lead the construction of all sectors of society. So what's it like to be a party member? In today's the Voices of the People, we go to northeastern city of Xinjiang to ask people what sets party members apart. Compared with ordinary people, CPC members work harder. CPC members pay attention to people's livelihood. For example, during the coronavirus outbreak, many CPC members living in our district helped and supported other residents. CPC members always have other people in mind and help them so that they can have a prosperous life. I believe CPC members come from the masses. People cannot live without the CPC leadership and party members also need the support of people. We are one family. I believe CPC members serve people wholeheartedly. They devote themselves to ordinary people. CPC members have more responsibilities. For example, during the coronavirus outbreak and earthquakes, most CPC members went to the front line to help protect ordinary people. And tomorrow in our special series, we'll focus on the self-reliant and hard-working spirit of the Communist Party of China. So stay tuned to CGTN or follow us on social media for the latest from our series on the CPC's uh, centenary. And with all that, we come to the end of this edition of Global Watch. I'm Li Dongning in Beijing. Thanks for watching. Stay with me for more news updates coming up.